First, obviously, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, I have not uh, thought about Du Châtelet or had not thought about Du Châtelet for 20 years when I got the invitation. Uh, so I've done a little bit of a crash course uh, and I've enjoyed very much learning from everybody at this conference. It'll probably be obvious uh, in my paper that <laughs> my views are evolving by the minute. Uh, so there might be some even changes within the, the paper, I'm not sure. Uh, but in any case, uh, I'm taking this as an opportunity to right a wrong. Uh, so in an earlier paper where I did do a little work on Tuchetle, only a little, uh, I described her as one of Wolf's expositors and I used her as a foil for Kant's complaints against the so-called metaphysicians. Since then, as I've discovered, there's been a huge amount of great work on Duchatelet. So I'm, as I said, taking this opportunity to reassess uh, her views about mathematics, their relation to, to uh, Wolf and Leibniz, and especially to Kant. So I think it's still true, as I said in that paper, that her presentation of her view fits very well with Kant's description of the kind of view that he was opposing. But the recent work has shown that her view is much subtler than I realized uh, and should therefore lead to a somewhat subtler understanding of what Kant was opposing. I've also, and this is where uh, you may see some discontinuity in the paper, uh, I got very interested in various claims I came across in the secondary literature suggesting that uh, du Châtelet anticipates Kant's views in, in various ways. Um, so I, I sort of tried to develop that a little bit in, in this paper or address that a, very briefly in the third part of the paper, which I mostly wrote yesterday. <laughs> um, I apologize. So, so one thing I, I want to say is I, I think, so I missed the first talk yesterday because I couldn't uh, get the Zoom link to work, but I asked, or sorry, the second talk, I asked, and the first, I asked Clara to send me her paper, which she did this morning. So that is actually why I don't have slides. Uh, I was going to finish my slides on the lunch break, but instead I read Clara's wonderful paper. And I think I'm echoing things that she said in that paper that she said much more, more clearly. So, so there might be a nice symmetry between the first talk of the conference and the, the last talk <laughs> of the conference. So we'll see. All right, so to the paper. Kant objected to the metaphysicians who uh, he thought in the face of a conflict with mathematics, tried to rescue their metaphysical claims by turning mathematical concepts into subtle fictions, which have little truth to them outside the field of mathematics. Since Du Châtelet explicitly refers to geometrical objects as fictions, her view seems to be a natural target of Kant's complaints. More starkly, her claim that the infinite divisibility of extension is at the same time a geometrical truth and a physical error, and that all the reasoning about the divisibility of matter to infinity drawn from geometrical considerations are absolutely inapplicable to natural bodies, those claims seem to encapsulate exactly what Kant is objecting to. So I claimed in, in that earlier paper that Kant's dissatisfaction with this kind of view partly led him to draw the distinction between sensibility and understanding as distinct faculties uh, as distinct faculties in the inaugural dissertation. His diagnosis of the metaphys metaphysician's mistake was that they were taking sensibility to provide us with confused perception of what's known clearly by the intellect. But having read the second secondary literature on Du Châtelet, like I said, I want to reconsider whether and to what extent she might have been subject to that complaint, to those complaints. So that takes up the first two parts of the paper. Of course, uh, Kant would still not accept Du Châtelet's view, but for slightly different reasons than I, I gave before, and reasons which are still addressed by the distinction between the faculties. But in the last part of the paper, a uh, very speculative part, 
uh, I want to explore some similarities between them, some, some supposed similarities and some genuine similarities between them. Okay, so I've talked about the problem um, posed by the metaphysician's view. We got a very good uh, characterization of that yesterday, but uh, for now, I'll just summarize it very quickly. So geometry tells us that space is infinitely divisible. Therefore, what occupies space, extension and bodies are also infinitely divisible. What's infinitely divisible can't be made up of parts since there are no smallest parts. Rather, the whole must precede the part. Bodies, therefore, must be prior to their parts. But according to the metaphysician's principle, bodies are composed of simple parts and so are not prior to their parts. And we get the supposed conflict. The, solu the supposed solution to the problem requires, it seems, a distinction between levels of reality, at least on the, the metaphysician's view. Whatever is infinitely divisible is not real, but is ideal or imaginary or fictional or, or whatever. So uh, I want to look now at Du Châtelet's solution, uh, which is rooted in her account of extension and space as phenomenal and imaginary. So that she adheres to the metaphysician's principles seems clear ish from chapter seven, where she presents what she calls Leibniz's system of monads or elements of matter, which she says in the hands of Wolf took on a totally new form. Given that all bodies are extended, there must be a sufficient reason for this extension that explains how and why it's possible. Mm -hmm. Saying as the atomists would that there is extension because there are small extended particles won't do because we can then ask the same question of those particles in order to satisfy the principle of sufficient reason then to give a reason for that which is extended and has particles we have to come to something that's without extension and has no particles a simple being so uh du Châtelet says compounds extended beings exist because there are simple beings she says this astonishes the imagination because these simple beings can't be represented by images. Rather, only the understanding can conceive of simple beings. And the sufficient reason for an extended composed being can only be found in simple beings without extension, just as the sufficient reason for a compound number can only be found in a non-compound number or a unit. So in chapter five of the Institution, uh, du Châtelet explains how we come to have the idea of extension from diversity and union. So she says, when we consider two things to be different, and when we distinguish one from the other, in our minds we place one outside of the other. Thus, everything that we consider to be different from us, we see as outside us. The examples are of an imagined structure that we represent as outside ourselves. And because we know it's different from us, and in order to, uh, uh, and in order to represent, uh, uh, and another example is uh, in order to represent ideally two people or even the same person twice, we place them outside each other. Otherwise, we'd have to imagine that they are one and two at the same time. To represent them as numerically distinct, we represent them as outside each other. She then asserts that it follows from this that we cannot represent to ourselves several different things as being one, as we do when representing compounds, presumably, without this resulting in a notion that is attached to this diversity and to this union of things. And this notion we call extension. So in short, the representation of several different things outside each other as one results in the notion of extension. In section 133 of chapter six, specifically how the idea of extension can result from an assemblage of simple unextended beings, the elements. She says the elements exist, each of them necessarily outside of the others, since one can never be the other. Because in addition, the elements are all united and linked together, 
they give rise to an assembly of several diverse coexisting things, each of which exists outside the others and which by their interconnections make a whole. Referring back to chapter five, where she claims to have shown that we cannot represent extension other than as such an assembly, she concludes that thus an aggregate of simple beings must be extended. It's not obvious to me, given the argument in chapter five, that she's entitled to the claim of necessity, since she seems there just to be describing how the representation uh, of extension arises. Um, and this, I think, is borne out to some extent by the passage where she explains that although extension seems to us to be a substance, since it endures and can be modified, it's not, in fact. So she says, if we examine this idea with the eyes of understanding, we'll be obliged to recognize that it's nothing but a phenomenon, an abstraction of several real things, by the confusion of which we form for ourselves this idea of extension. It's from this confusion that arise almost all the objects that fall under our senses and of which the realities are often infinitely different from the appearances. So there's much uh, to unpack here, because for one thing, this passage certainly suggests that she's a target of Kant's objection, but I'll come back to that later. What is important for now is that our representation of extension is the result of confusion, the same confusion that gives rise to almost all the objects that fall under our senses. Indeed, she says, if we could see distinctly all that composes extension, this appearance of extension that falls under our senses would disappear, and our soul would perceive only simple beings existing outside of each other. Instead, we have only an idea of several things coexisting and linked together without our knowing distinctly how they are linked, and it's this confused idea that brings into being the phenomenon of extension. So I have to say here, uh, this is one of the parts of the text that I struggled the most with, uh, this account of extension. So I've waffled a little bit on uh, uh, whether the real things we abstract from are themselves extended. Um, and this is why I presented the, the treatments in chapter five and the discussion in chapter seven separately, because I'm not sure exactly how those fit together. So this is, I'm throwing out a, uh, an appeal for help here uh, in the question period, maybe. I found this difficult. I'm not sure my general point hangs that much on it, but it, it obviously will uh, make a difference um, in the long run. Okay, back to chapter five. Having formed a being in our imagination, extension, from the diversity of the existence of several things and of their union. What of space? Well, as we've just seen, to form the idea of extension, we consider only the plurality of things and their union while excluding every other determination. If we then in turn consider the parts of extension abstractly without taking into account their limits or their shapes, we see that they must not have any internal differences. They differ only in number because we've excluded all the other determinations and all the parts are the same with respect to plurality and unity. We can substitute one in the place of another without destroying the unity and plurality, which are the only determinations we're attending to. By contrast, in the real underlying order, an element could not be removed from its place and replaced with another while conserving the same sequence of things. Such a change would change the universe, she says. So any two parts of extension differ only in being two and not one, and all of extension must be conceived of as being uniform, homogeneous, and with no internal determinations that distinguish one part from another. She says, as long as we consider the possibility that several different things can exist together in this abstract being we call extension, we form the notion of space, 
which is nothing other than the notion of extension joined to the possibility of restoring to the coexistent and unified beings from which the notion was formed, the determinations that we had previously stripped from them by abstraction. So by considering extension without paying attention to the determinations of the beings that constitute it, we acquire the idea of space. And she goes on to explain how this space appears to us as continuous, infinite, immutable, et cetera, even though these alleged properties, as well as the being in which we suppose them to exist, have no reality but in the abstractions of our mind. Nothing like this idea does or can exist. And this ability to abstract enables the imagination to help the understanding contemplate its idea, so long as we take care that the imagination does not mislead us. For these imaginary notions, uh, these fictions become very dangerous if we mistakenly take them for realities. She also, however, distinguishes this imaginary idea of space from actual space. Because space is an abstraction, there must be a real and determined being from which we're abstracting, whatever that might be. So there's only space insofar as there are real and coexistent things. She takes it to follow that we can't apply to actual space the demonstrations concerning imaginary space. That's what leads into the labyrinth of errors. So she discusses these errors in chapter nine. They arise when philosophers confuse the abstractions of our mind with physical body and attempt to demonstrate the divisibility of matter to infinity by appeal to reasoning of the geometers on the divisibility of lines that one pushes to infinity. The problem is that geometrical body is simple extension. We've abstracted away all determinations so that the number of the parts is absolutely indeterminate and doesn't enter into the notion of extension. So we can therefore determine the number as we wish without harming the extension. Geometrical body has no determinate and actual parts, but rather contains nothing but simply possible parts, which can increase to infinity as one wills. But she says, things are quite different in nature where everything that exists must be determined in every way. So for example, she says, I can consider a foot as finite insofar as it contains nothing but a certain number of simple beings. But I can also suppose it to be divided into an infinity of parts, considering it as an abstract extension. These parts though would never make up, recompose the, the foot which would then become a geometrical body because of all its properties, I would only retain in my mind that of the extension. And it's at this point that Zuchatelet asserts that the divisibility of extension to infinity is at the same time a geometrical truth and a physical error. So she's certainly subject to Kant's charge of distinguishing geometrical from physical space. But as, as Aaron Wells has pointed out, the physical error isn't the continuity of matter, but rather the belief that matter is actually composed of an infinite number of parts, such that the parts are prior to the whole. So as he argues, she upholds the infinite potential divisibil divisibility of matter, which permits its usefulness in physical explanations. So we'll have to see um, if this is good enough for, for Kant to escape his objections. So I turn now to Kant and the inaugural dissertation. So, so remember the reason I'm looking at the inaugural dissertation is because I'm I'm I was claiming that this uh this the diagnosis of this mistake of the metaphysicians leads Kant in part to draw the distinction between the sensible and the uh, intelligible or intellectual um, as he does in the inaugural dissertation. 
So the inaugural dissertation on the form and principles of the sensible and intelligible world in there Kent motivates this distinction between the sensible and intelligible world by comparing the intelligible and sensible concepts of a whole and of simples. So this is right at the very beginning. We can conceive the composition of a whole by means of the abstract concept of composition in general, insofar as a number of things are contained under it in reciprocal relations to each other. Presumably the way Du Châtelet conceives of a substantial compound composed of simple elements. Similarly, when the substantial compound is given, we arrive at the idea of a simple by taking away the general concept of composition. The things that remain when every element of conjunction has been removed, he says, are simple beings. But he contrasts the case where we represent the same concepts in the concrete by a distinct intuition, a representation that he says rests on conditions of time. So arriving at the concept of a compound requires the successive addition of part to part, a synthesis to form a totality. And arriving at the concept of a simple requires a regress from the given whole to all its possible parts whatsoever by analysis to arrive at a multiplicity. Because the analysis and synthesis fall under the laws of intuition, they'll only be completed and the concepts of a compound and a simple will only emerge if these processes can be carried out in a finite and specifiable period of time. Obviously, this poses a, a problem for the representation of continuous magnitudes, where the regression from whole to parts, which are able to be given, he says, and the pro progression from parts to the given whole have no limit. So the whole can't be thought completely as regards composition, and the compound can't be thought as regards totality. In other words, a continuous magnitude cannot be thought of either as composed of simples or as an infinite totality. And Kant objects that on this basis, the concepts of the continuous and the infinite are frequently rejected. So while it's true that a continuous magnitude can't be thought as a totality or as a compound in accordance with the laws of intuitive cognition, Kant thinks it's a mistake to reject the concepts on that basis. Instead, we should recognize that this shows a lack of accord between the sensitive faculty and the faculty of the understanding. And we can avoid these mistakes by keeping straight the distinct sources of our concepts. So this is where the, the distinction between the faculties is supposed to address this problem. We then get the familiar uh, characterization of sensibility as the receptivity of a subject to be affected by the presence of an object. Sensible cognition therefore depends on the special character of the subject. It represents things as they appear, whereas intellectual cognition, uh, which represent things that cannot by their own quality come before the senses is of things as they are. Now, this may just sound like uh, uh, the metaphysician's way of resolving the problem, especially since Kant explicitly invokes the language of phenomena for sensible cognition. So things appear continuous, but they aren't really in themselves, crudely put. Sounds like that's what he's saying. But the difference becomes clear once Kant invokes the distinction between the form and the matter of sensible things. The form arises according as the various things which affect the senses are coordinated by a certain natural law of the mind. This must be so because objects do not strike the senses in virtue of their form, he says. So if the various factors in an object which affect the senses are to coalesce into a representational whole, there must be an internal principle in the mind so that the factors coalesce in accordance with stable and innate laws. I think it's this appeal to law likeness that allows Kant to conclude that there's a science of sensory things, 
And among these laws are the principles of sensitive form found in geometry. So all sensible things are thought in this form of sensibility. And thus, he says, it contains the concepts of space and time. These are the objects of pure mathematics, which we can therefore take, he says, to explain the form of all our sensitive cognition and to be the organon of each and every intuitive uh, and distinct cognition. Because space and time are originary intuitions, he says, pure mathematics provides us with cognition, which is in the highest degree true, and provides us with a paradigm of the highest kind of evidence. There is, thus he concludes, a science of sensory things. Far from sensory cognition, just being confused. There's a science of sensory things. He notes that cognitions must always be treated as sensitive cognitions, no matter how extensive the use of the understanding may have been on them. In particular, no matter how high they ascend by abstracting, they always remain sensitive. From all of that, Kant concludes that the sensitive is poorly defined as that which is more confusedly cognized and that which belongs to the understanding as that of which there is distinct cognition. Sensitive representations, he says, can be very distinct as in geometry and representations of the understanding can be extremely confused as in metaphysics. So uh, I'll suggest in the last part of the paper that du Châtelet may actually agree with Kant on this, on this way of uh, drawing the distinction. So what I've described up to now is Kant's outline of his view and his explanation of how it's supposed to rescue the claim uh, to a science of sensible things. But he goes on to argue for the picture. So there he presents it. Um, so he, he gives a, an overview of it and explains how it's going to solve. Once he's established it, it's going to solve the, these problems. But he goes on then to argue for the picture in section three on the principles of the form of the sensible world. So he starts by distinguishing the objective principle of the form of the intelligible world, which is the cause in virtue of which things that exist in themselves are combined together, from the subjective principle of the sensible world, which is a fixed law of the mind in virtue of which it's necessary that all the things that can be objects of the senses are seen as necessarily belonging to the same whole. These formal principles of the phenomenal universe he describes as primary and universal, the schemata and conditions of everything sensitive in human cognition. The emphasis on primacy suggests that they're not derivative from a more fundamental order. So they themselves contain the ground of the universal connection of all things insofar as they are phenomena. In other words, the ground of the connection of phenomena is itself sensible and doesn't embrace immaterial substances or the cause of the world. So it's embrace, he says, is limited to actual things insofar as they're thought capable of falling under the senses. I won't go into the arguments for the, the two principles, space and time, in any detail because they're presumably familiar. And I believe Clara went through the critical version of the arguments uh, in her talk yesterday. But the basic argument is that the ideas of time and space can't arise from the senses because they're presupposed by the senses. So he says succession doesn't generate the concept of time, but appeals to it. The concept of time is very badly defined if it's defined in terms of the series of actual things which exist one after the other, for I only understand the meaning of the little word after by means of the antecedent concept of time. Similarly, the concept of space is not abstracted from outer sensations because I may only conceive of something as placed outside me by representing it as in a place which is different from the place I'm in myself. And I may only conceive of things outside one another by locating them in different places in space. So the possibility of outer perceptions 
presupposes the concept of space and doesn't create it. So this seems to uh, conflict with Duchatelet's claim that the idea of extension results from the way we represent things uh, as outside us. But again, I'm not sure about this. I remain uh, neutral for my purposes now. In any case, the, the proponents of the view that space is a relation uh, the relation between existing things, Kant says, are entangled in an obvious circle. <clears throat> Even worse, though, they cast, and this is the important point, this is why I can remain neutral for now on whether that captures to Châtelet or not. Even worse, they cast geometry down from its summit of certainty and render it merely empirical. They thereby undermine the necessity and precision of geometry. So whether or not Duchatelet's view is subject to the circularity objection, the main point is that for Kant, since nothing can be given to the senses unless it conforms with the fundamental act Sorry. Um, uh, yeah, whether or not she's subject to the circularity objection, the main point is that for Kant, since nothing can be given to the senses unless it conforms with the fundamental axioms of space, whatever can be given to the senses will necessarily accord with these axioms. He says, nature is completely subject to the prescriptions of geometry in respect of all the properties of space which are demonstrated in geometry. So there's no distinction between physical and geometrical space. And this is so, Kant emphasizes, not on the basis of an invented hypothesis, but on the basis of one which has been intuitively given as the condition under which nature can be revealed to the senses. This is what Kant's objection to Du Châtelet's view, I think, would be. By taking the idea of space to arise out of confusion and abstraction, she can't capture the necessity and precision with which geometry applies to the natural world. So again, Aaron has explained how Duchatelet's fictional objects can play an important role in natural philosophy, how you know, we can be justified in drawing conclusions about the physical world from mathematics, even if the conclusions are only approximate uh, or approximately true. But that doesn't seem to be enough uh, for Kant. It's not just the, the, the usefulness uh, that they have a role in natural philosophy. It's something about the nature of that role. So he wants in particular mathematics to give us genuine cognition of objects, or uh, as he puts it later, uh, universal objective validity. In the corollary to part three, Kant, completes the separation of the sensible and the intelligible. In the case of singular intuition, he says the parts, and in particular the simple parts, do not, as the laws of reason prescribe, contain the ground of the possibility of a compound. Rather, the infinite contains the ground of each part which can be thought, and ultimately the ground of the simple, or rather the limit, uh, since only when both infinite space and time are given can a definite time, uh, space and time be specified by limiting. The fundamental properties of these concepts lie beyond the limits of reason and so can't be explained by the understanding. So in these passages, uh, Kant suggests the independence of the sensible and intelligible worlds but in the next section on the principle of the form of the intelligible world, he indicates perhaps otherwise. He says the principle upon which the universal coordination of all substances itself rests when seen intuitively is space. And he describes time as the phenomenal eternity of the general cause. At this point, he warns us though, that it's more advisable to keep close to the shore of the cognitions granted to us by the modest character of our understanding, rather than put out into the deep sea of such mystical investigations. So 
uh, I mentioned this passage um, because it's a, it's a puzzling passage for one thing, but also because I, I I'm taking it as a segue into the other, the third part of the paper, uh, which is not completely obviously connected to the first part, though I will make an attempt to connect them later. Um, so this is a little bit artificial, this transition, but um, nonetheless, uh, I'd like to hear more about um, what I'm about to, to talk about. So what Kant is giving us here is a reminder about epistemological modesty, basically. And that invites, sort of, a comparison with Duchatelet, who makes similar claims to epistemological modesty, it seems. So in this last part of the paper, I want to return to her account of the phenomena, and in particular to the passage I, I cited earlier that I said seems to subject her to Kant's charge of taking sensibility to be confused perception of what's known clearly by the intellect. So that, that passage, the one I'm talking about is where he says that if we examine this idea of extension with the eyes of the understanding, we'll be obliged to recognize that it's nothing but a phenomenon, an abstraction of several real things by the confusion of which we form for ourselves this idea of extension, from the same confusion arise all the objects that fall under our senses, uh, of which the realities are often infinitely different from the appearances. It's clear that she's not actually saying that by means of the understanding, we have clear representations of the simple elements underlying yeah. phenomena, which thereby falsifies our cognition of phenomena. It's quite the opposite, in fact. For we finite beings, it's impossible for us to represent to ourselves the internal state of the simple being upon which the phenomenon of extension depends. So all perception of the realities, she says, must by our nature escape us. So what can we say of the simple elements? Well, this is the, the topic of chapter seven where uh, she canvasses treatments mm -hmm. of uh, the principles of things. She says, beginning with the ancients, then Descartes, then the atomists, and finally, Mr. Leibniz's system of monads or elements of matter given new form by Wolf. This system, she says, is very challenging to grasp. Uh, it astonishes the imagination because we can't re represent these simple things by images. Uh, only the understanding can conceive of them. What struck me rereading this chapter is that throughout the discussion, perhaps it shouldn't have, have uh, surprised me, but uh, it did. She appeals to physical examples to explain this system. So to have simple beings accepted less reluctantly, she says, the Leibnizians compare extension to a watch. When it comes to introduce the notion of force, she begins with the claim that perpetual change can be observed in compounds. Nothing stays in the same state. All tends to change in nature. There, there thus must be found in simple beings a principle of action. Experiment proves that the force of simple beings is deployed continuously. It follows that each simple being is in a motion that produces in it perpetual changes and a continuous succession different from those experienced by any other simple beings in the universe. So this feature of simple beings is presented as following from something we learn from experiments, she says. All of this, she says, makes it clear that simple beings are active. And she says, now we can understand what Mr. Leibniz meant when he said that the true character of the substance is to act. In other words, uh, the understanding conceives of the simple substances by means of analogies with physical things, with phenomena. She then proceeds, she says, to save from ridicule Leibniz's claim that our souls represent the entire universe and all of its changes by comparing us to a boat from which stones are thrown. I won't go into the details because the point is just that 
she appeals to physical phenomena to make clear to the understanding the metaphysical claims. So it's through the phenomena that we understand the symbols. This chapter on the elements of matter ends with Du Châtelet apparently distancing herself from Leibniz. She says, whether the monads of Mr. Leibniz are eventually accepted or rejected, our researches on the nature of things will be no less certain. For in our experiments, we never will arrive at these first elements of which bodies are composed and the physical atoms, though in their turn composed of simple beings, are more than sufficient to exercise our desire for knowledge. So there's this idea that that what's given in the phenomena, what we get at through the phenomena is sufficient to exercise our desire for knowledge. In chapter eight, she turns to the subject of bodies. Like extension, bodies are phenomena originating from the confusion of realities. In fact, she says, this degree of confusion and imperfection of our organs is necessary for us to see the objects in the way we do. She illustrates this with examples from within the phenomenal realm, a statue as it appears from far away and from close up, uh, blue and yellow mixed together make green, but if we look through a microscope, the phenomenon disappears and we only have blue and yellow particles placed next to each other. The color white is a phenomenon that originates from the confusion made on our retinas of all the primary colors. The prism makes this phenomenon disappear. With the prism and the microscope, our, our vision becomes more distinct, so the phenomena we take for realities disappear. Obviously, these are only analogies for the confused representation of symbols. Increasing clarity of vision is not going to get us back to the, the simple elements. And here she um, seems to distance herself from Leibniz again. In the system of Mr. Leibniz, this gradation would lead us all the way to simple beings or to monads, which, according to him, are the origin of all we see and the only real substances which exist. She concludes that it's therefore certain that there's nothing in nature like the colors and the objects that result from their combinations, nor like the tastes, sounds, and all the sensible qualities. So it shouldn't worry us that there's nothing in nature like simple elements. The phenomenal realm is sufficient to exercise our desire for knowledge. So all of this obviously dispels the idea of Du Châtelet as a dogmatic rationalist metaphysician, but of course um, we can we can do that for, for Wolf and Leibniz as well. But that raises the question of her relation to Kant. Like he does, she limits our cognitive claims to the phenomenal realm. Crudely put, it's not enough for Kant uh, just to just to, to relegate the simple elements outside the range of natural explanation. Because unless we can understand how the confusion arises from the relations among simple beings, we don't have a closed system, which seems to be what he wants. So uh, Ruth Hagengruber has suggested that, like Kant, uh, Du Châtelet establishes a system grounding the laws and arrangements according to which nature is organized and perceived. I'm not sure I quite see this, um, but I'd love to hear more about it. In any case, it's true that Du Châtelet does say that we can understand how the confusion arises. Um, and she does say that the degree of confusion is necessary for us to see the objects the way we do. But the particular form of the confusion is not shown to be necessary. For that, we'd have to uncover why the phenomena necessarily appear in the specific spatiotemporal way that they do. For that, I think we'd have to know distinctly how, the th how things are linked, which she says we don't. By contrast, Kant does claim to establish the principles of the phenomenal universe as the schemata and conditions of everything sensitive in human cognition. In the critique, this is the, the doctrine that space and time are a priori forms of intuition. And this is where I can try to, to tie up the two parts of the talk. 
Similarly, Du Chatelet's account of mathematical knowledge falls short of Kant's demand for the necessary accord between the axioms of space and everything that falls under the, the senses. It's a further question as to why Kant requires that, uh, demands that, or even whether he does demand that or whether that just falls out of a different uh, uh, a different project, which is what I think is the case. But anyway, I'll stop there. Very speculative, uh, on a very speculative note. <laughs>